welcome, Dr. Tatum. It is such an honor to, to be up here with you today. Thank you for joining us. Well, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited about our conversation. Great. I thought we would start just by diving right into the title of your book. Um, as any teacher who might be with us here tonight knows, you could have also called this book, Why Are All the Asian Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? Why Are All the White Kids Sitting Together? You could have called this book, why are our cafeterias so segregated? Why, how did you arrive at the title? That's a great question, and it really goes back to the 90s, right? So the first version of this book was published in 1997, and I wrote it after having been teaching a course on the psychology of racism uh, for many years, and as a consequence of that work, I started doing workshops for teachers and principals in school districts around the country. And whenever I would walk into a racially mixed school, someone would ask me, why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria? And I wanted to respond to that question, though of course, as you said, it could have been framed in a different way, but it never was. It always came to me in that way. And so when I wrote the book in 97, I called it, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria and Other Conversations About Race. It was, and I like to always emphasize the second half of the title and other conversations about race, because while of course the, the question, the, the question that appears in the title is addressed in the book, really the book is less about that particular question and more about understanding racism in the United States, how it operates, as I like to say, what, so what, and now what. What is racism? How does it operate in our current context? So what does that mean in terms of how we think about ourselves and other people? The identity development piece is right up in that so what section. And then now what? Now what can we do about it? How do we interrupt that cycle? And in fact, uh, towards the end of the book, you actually have whole sections about the experiences of our native students, our students our Asian students, our mixed race students. Um, was that sort of at the forefront that you always knew those sections were gonna be in the book? Well, when I started, the short answer is yes, and I'll tell you why. When I was teaching, you know, I started teaching about racism when I was 26 years old. The first time I taught a course on the psychology of racism was at UC Santa Barbara. As was mentioned, I started teaching there. And when I first started the work I was, you know, when I first started that teaching, it was very much around a black-white paradigm. But I had Latino students in my class, I had Asian students in my class, and they would say, you know, where, where am I in this narrative? And that encouraged me over time to expand how I thought about that course and, uh, and recognizing as I learned more about the experiences of institutionalized racism um, across different groups, historically past and present, it was clear to me that I should write my book in the most inclusive way. So when I wrote it in 1997, I was thinking about my students and wanting to be sure that they would see themselves in the book. Fast forward 20 years, one of the things that's really different about this version of my book is that those sections have been expanded. And that really um, in part reflects the changing demographics of our society and for example, in the first version of the book there was maybe a paragraph about um, students from the Middle East, um, Muslim students. Now anybody can be a Muslim, right? It's not geographically located, but we often associate Middle Eastern identity with being Muslim and particularly in today's context in 2017, it seemed important to include Middle Easterners, North Africans in the book, and so there's a much expanded section um, as one example. How much of, um, a lot has changed in the last 20 years, but when you bring up especially the experiences of our Muslim students, mm -hmm. a lot has changed in that conversation just in the last year, mm -hmm. considering with our last presidential election, how much as you were getting ready to publish this anniversary edition, how much has been changed over the last 20 years, and how much has been changed in as you edited this book just in the last 12 months? Well, as I was working on the book, I was working on it right up and so I was working on it during the season of our election, 2016, and I, can, I turned it into my publisher in March 2017. So anything that happened up until March <laughs> is in there. 
Um, but certainly some things that have happened since then are not. So for example, Charlottesville is not in the book because it was already in press when those events happened. But particularly for the section where I was writing about the experiences of um, Muslim students in an increasingly Islamophobic society, um, certainly 9-11, 2001 is a, a marker for a lot of people, you know, in terms of how um, their life experience shifted following that particular set of events. Um, and in fact, you have a whole chapter at the beginning of the book that is, I feel like we should acknowledge the elephant in the room or the elephant on Twitter, which is you have a whole section entitled the Trump, what is it called? The uh, Living in the Age of Trump. Yes. Was that was that a chapter that you were eager to write or that you <laughs> dreaded writing? Like, well, you know, it's you, right at the beginning of the book. What was that like yeah. for you? Well, let me just start out by saying the book does start with a prologue, mm -hmm. right? Um, and when I, you know, as was mentioned, I served as president of Spelman College from 2002 to 2015, 13 years. And when I got ready to stop doing that, when I announced I was going to retire, many people asked me, well, what are you going to do next? So this is 2015. And I said, well, my first project is I want to update my book, the one we're talking about. Why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria and other conversations about race? And I, um, and so when I s told my friends and other people that this is what I was planning to do, and while I was doing it, people would ask me, do they still sit together? <laughs> and, uh, you know, 20 years later, are they still sitting together? And we know the answer to that question is yes. But then the question I would be asked was, is it better? And so isn't anything better? And that question is a more complex question. And it was really that question that I wanted to reflect on in the prologue of the book. You know, what, what is different? What has happened in the last 20 years relative to race relations? And as I'm working on that, right, so I started working on the book in, really working on it in earnest in 2016, I'm working on it and this election is happening. And so, of course, those daily news items, <laughs> those daily news You're items. You're writing prompts, really. <laughs> really, yes. no, I, I have to say, you know, thank goodness for the New York Times and the Washington Post. I mean, I was constantly getting new information uh, to incorporate and to situate relative to, you know, not just the election, though, of course, that had, you know, that was giving us plenty of information. But even if you go back, well, to just say a little bit more, I mean, there's sort of several patterns that have shifted over the last 20 years. One of them is demographics, right? We know our population has changed. And so I was born in 1954. I know I'm not the only 50s baby in the room, I suspect. Um, at that time, the U.S. population was 90% white. Wow, yeah, 90% white. 90% <laughs> white. In 2014, 60 years later, the school-age population was majority kids of color, more than 50% children of color for the first time. And so that's a dramatic shift, right, in our population. But some things didn't change. Demographics changed, but school segregation did not, right? Same, new faces, same places. But if we think about, uh, and in fact, today, public schools are more segregated than they were 20 years ago. Neighborhoods continue to be segregated. In the last 20 years, we've seen a backlash against affirmative action, and that has had certainly implications for higher education in significant ways, particularly state institutions in those states where affirmative action has been outlawed, places like California, Michigan, et cetera. Um, we also see in the last 20 years the dramatic rise. Um, Dr. Abe was talking about discipline, disparate, disciplinary practices. You know, we hear today references about the school to prison pipeline. We know that mass incarceration as a phenomenon really took off in the 90s. Um, so there's been that 20 year history of that. 
in the last 20 years, we also know about the impact of the collapse of the economy, the 2008 financial crisis, and the exacerbation of income inequality, particularly in, um, as it relates to communities of color, black and Latinx in particular. As an example, Native Americans certainly, and we think about the, all the police shootings, right, of the more recent, you know, the last, uh, you know, if we start with Trayvon Martin, which was not a police shooting, but 2012, followed by the various cases we are all familiar with in the, you know, 2013, 2014, 2015, and all of that, you know, I'm trying to make sense of all of that, and I'm working on that, writing about those things, and then we have this election. And so that, of course, was very significant in terms of the ways in which the rhetoric um, coming from candidate Trump really was enlivening um, and emboldening the activity of neo-Nazi groups and white supremacist groups, and certainly post-election, we saw a, a continued rise. I want to say dramatic rise, and maybe it was dramatic, but really since 2008, the election of President Obama, another significant thing, of course, in the last 20 years, um, since his election, in response to his election, there has been a continuing rise in hate crime uh, activity and hate group activity, particularly internet activity. I want to uh, circle back to an earlier comment you, you were talking about, affirmative action. Yes. One of, I think, the great services your book does is it gives a very clear explanation about what affirmative action is and what it is not. I think it should be required reading for anybody getting into that debate. Yes. Um, and you talk about clearly that affirmative action is not a set of quotas. It's right. not a required number. And i just like to read from your... Uh, but you give actionable solutions. You not only analyze the problem, but you give us ideas to how to move forward. And you say that schools concerned about meeting the needs of an increasingly diverse student population should be looking specifically for teachers of all backgrounds with demonstrated experience in working with multiracial populations, with courses on their transcripts like psychology uh, of racism, race, class, culture, and gender in the classroom, and foundations of multicultural education, to name a few. And you talk about how these are courses that are likely to be met by candidates of color, um, you know, without talking about quotas, without talking about race in the application, that looking for people who come from an academic interest in inclusivity. Yes. You know, I, I thought that that was so um, powerful and useful, you know, especially in the country, almost 80% of our teachers are white, mm -hmm. and yet the majority of our kids are kids of color. In Washington state, that's 90% of mm -hmm. our teachers. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking back um, when I was a teacher in Bellevue, Washington, which is a primarily Asian community, um, I was one of the only teachers of color on staff for my first few years teaching there. And I remember talking to the principal about um, when she was hiring new teachers, I hope that this is an opportunity to bring in more diverse teachers into our community. And she said that they just don't apply, that they just don't want to teach here, meaning mm -hmm. people of color. Yeah. Um, what would you say to a principal whose staff doesn't reflect their student body, um, who, who is saying they just don't apply? Well, there's two things I would say. Um, the first thing I would say has to do with how are you looking, right? You know, when we think about, I I'm going to tell a short story, which is a personal story. So I taught for a number of years at Westfield State College. That was mentioned in my bio, now known as Westfield State University in Massachusetts. I was tenured there. I was teaching in the psychology department. I was not looking for another job. And one day I got a letter that came to me. It said it wasn't addressed. It was addressed to me, but not um, personalized. It was a letter. It said, "Dear colleague," you know, came in my mailbox. "Dear colleague, we're looking for a, a tenure track faculty member to teach courses in." And then the description sounded like me. You know, courses in um, minority mental health, 
psychology of racism. It wasn't worded quite like that. But when I was reading the description, I was thinking, they're looking for someone like me. But it came to me because, not because anyone said, oh, we want Beverly Tatum to apply for this job. But it was basically, a, you know, dear colleague, we're looking, would you please pass this information on to interested graduate students, anybody you know, who, you, you know, they were networking, right? That letter came to me from someone at Mount Holyoke College. I read it, I thought, gosh, as I said, I wasn't looking for a job, but I read it and I thought, this job sounds like it has my name on it. I should explore it. I did, lo and behold, I got that job and you know the rest is history. But I wanna tell you, how did they get my name? Someone sitting in an office at Mount Holyoke College hired a graduate student or maybe a smart senior, some work study student and asked them to go through the American Psychological Association annual program book and send the letter to anyone who'd done a presentation on topics related to the interests that they were looking for. That's, I did, I did a presentation at APA, so my name was in that list, and so I got one of those letters. So I say this to say, if you're creative in your search process, you can often find candidates who might, you know, was I looking for a job in South Hadley, Massachusetts? I was not. but. <laughs> Um, but when I got this letter, I was sufficiently intrigued by a department that was looking for someone who did the kinds of things that I did that I decided I would apply. And proactively looking for them in unconventional ways. Yes, exactly. So the first thing we have to talk about is how do we recruit, right? If we're just putting, if you do what you always did, you will get what you always got, right? And so that, that's the first thing. But the second thing and it has to do with the quote you read, is that there are some places that it is going to be harder to attract people of color. I did a workshop once at a college um, in upstate New York, close to the Canadian border, a long way from any urban center. Most black people I know don't want to live there. I'm just saying. <laughs> Does that mean that no black person wants to live there? Well, actually, that's, there are some black people who work at that university. Some of them are alums of the university. Some of them, you know, for whatever reasons, have their own uh, interests in living in a rural community that's relatively isolated, right? Not everybody wants to work there. But here's the thing. That institution, like the school district you're describing, has students of color. Um, and those students need faculty who can connect with them, uh, engage them, hold high expectations for them, all of that. And sometimes those faculty, in an ideal world, there would be a similarity in experience, but it doesn't have to be that. Um, if you have faculty who are able to connect across lines of difference, um, who are able to be reflective about potential biases they might have grown up with and move beyond them, those teachers, even if they're not of the same racial background, can be quite successful, and the children they teach can be quite successful. So the question is, yes, let us aggressively recruit and be proactive, but let's also be um, thinking critically about those teachers we're hiring who are part of the dominant group, in this case white teachers, um, because not all white teachers are the same in terms of their uh, capacity to be able to engage with students whose backgrounds are different from their own. Um, speaking of white people, I have um, <laughs> this quote really stuck out to me because I heard actually Dr. Abe's voice echoing in my mind when I read it from you. Um, I have heard him say a similar thing, but that you said that for many white people to be called racist is the ultimate insult. Yes. And then you go on to say that all white people intentionally or unintentionally do benefit from racism. And I think here in Seattle, it's a progressive city. It's a city that wants to not only do the right thing, we want to say the right thing. We don't want to say the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people that, that are, are great allies in Seattle. Yes. Um, 
do you think that the the kind of the guilt of knowing that, of knowing that all white people do benefit from racism, whether you intend to or not, do you think that that guilt is necessary? Do you think that that guilt can be productive? What would you say to our Seattle allies? I don't think guilt is productive. That's not to say people don't feel it, right? But don't get stuck in it, right? So if we understand There are, uh, there are a number of analogies I use in the book, and one of them is um, one of them has to do with smog. I'm going to talk about the smog here for a moment. So I talk in the book about the fact that we all are exposed to information, inaccurate information. We all get misinformation about people different from ourselves. It comes to us through the form of stereotypes, the images we see on television, the stereotypes in the books we read, the jokes we hear people tell, all that stuff. We're all exposed to that. It's so pervasive, I say it's like smog in the air. If you live in a smoggy place, you will be a smog breather. Right? Nobody goes around and says, hi, Beverly Tatum, smog breather, do you know? But, um, but if you live in a smoggy place, you're going to be breathing in that smog because, not because you want to, not because you think it's good for you, but because it's the only air available, right? And if you breathe in smog, you will, on occasion, breathe some out. That's inevitably going to happen. That can happen to any of us, regardless of our racial or ethnic background, right? We all get this misinformation. I said misinformation about people different from ourselves. We also get misinformation about people like ourselves, right? So we're all breathing in smog. You breathe some in, you're going to breathe some out. We just need to acknowledge that. And what becomes most important is not, are you a smog breather, but what are you doing to clean up the air? Right? We all have a responsibility for cleaning up the air. And I, when I describe the smog, I'm really talking about prejudice, right? how we are all exposed to prejudice. But when we talk about racism, defined in my book as a system of advantage based on race, we are, not, we are all breathing the smog, breathing in, breathing out, we're all breathing that smog, but we're not all systematically advantaged. Right? Some people are systematically disadvantaged, some people are systematically advantaged. In my teaching experience, when I was teaching my course on the psychology of racism, I found that my students, most of whom were white, because when I was teaching, I was teaching in majority white institutions, um, I found that my students were very clear that racism disadvantaged people of color. But they were less clear about racism advantaging white people, right? But if one group is being disadvantaged, it just goes without saying, I guess it doesn't go without saying, but it is a true statement that if one group is systematically disadvantaged, somebody else is being systematically advantaged. And acknowledging that might make someone feel guilty, but it doesn't have to. It is, um, but it, it comes back, much like I talked about the air, the question is not are you systematically advantaged or not, the question is how are you using your advantage to interrupt the cycle of racism? Mm. That's the key question. And if you are stuck in feeling, woe is me, I'm advantaged, do you know? <laughs> um, you can't be an effective interrupter, right? right? So you, we, getting to being an effective interrupter is the challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, part of that kind of clearing the smog, you talk about race-conscious parenting yes. in your book, and you share some really great examples of your own conversation with your sons. And mm -hmm. um, I was really moved, if you haven't seen Dr. Tatum's TEDx talk from Stanford last year, it's really, really an incredible example of kind of how the intersection of your lives as, a, as an activist and as a writer comes home with you as well. Yes. Um, you talk about... Well, you have such an amazing moment of explaining slavery to your four-year-old son. Uh, were you a parent when you first wrote the first edition to the I book? I was, you yeah. Were, how has, has your role as a parent impacted the way you've done this research or the way that, you, you know, your children have come of age then with your book? Sure, yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. So let me just say that, um, so when I was writing my book, anyone who's read the, how many of you have read the 1997, the earlier version? Quite a lot. Um, not everyone, of course. But if you read the earlier version, you know, my kids were small. Now, now 20 years later, they're adults, right? But my kids were small when I was writing that book, and those stories were real things that, you know, the examples that I used from my children. And, um, and it has been very, as they got older, I stopped writing about them. <laughs> <laughs> At their request? <laughs> kind of, yes. Right. Um, I'm not above telling stories, but I didn't <laughs> put them in writing. The, um, but it, it is the case that you know, the conversations, I mean, the questions kids ask, you know, my, I'll tell just a little bit of that, I'm not going to repeat the TEDx talk because you can all watch it, you know, when you get home on YouTube, um, but the title of it is, Is My Skin Brown Because I Drank Chocolate Milk? <laughs> and the question came from a conversation I had with our oldest son when he was three and came home from preschool and said, Tommy says, my skin is brown because I drank chocolate milk. Is that true? Of course, it wasn't true, and I, <laughs> and, and I said, no, that's not true. Your skin is brown because you have something in your skin called melanin. Everybody has some, um, and it's what makes your skin brown, and the more you have, the browner your skin is. So everybody has some. Even Tommy has some. Remember, he went to visit his grandmother. He came home with a tan. It was the melanin in his skin that made his um, skin turn brown. I said, but... At your school, you are the kid with the most. <laughs> and he was quite tickled to be the, <laughs> the kid with the most of something. <laughs> but, but it was um, important to me to go to the school to ask the question of the teacher, you know, how are you dealing with these questions about difference as they're emerging in the classroom? And to my surprise, the teacher said, it hasn't come up. Well, of course it did come up. You know, I heard about it from our son, but what I realized then was that there are some conversations that maybe we tune out. Mm -hmm. You know, that maybe there's a kind of selective inattention. And that if you don't know what to say, or if you don't know how to respond, it's easy to kind of oh, maybe I'll deal with that. You know, maybe we don't need to talk about that. Let's just move to the doll corner or something. You know what I mean? That you can just redirect or hush or uh, avoid. But unfortunately, that leads to a kind of silence that is dysfunctional. And you, and you talk about that we were moving away. Your first book was published <coughs> in the 90s when we were, you know, that whole conversation about love sees no color. Yes. You know, we were talking, we were celebrating colorblindness. That's changed. And I, I think that more and more people are, are not claiming that that's possible to be colorblind. And you actually have a term for it that, it, that we're not colorblind, but that we are race silent. Color silent. Or yes. color, yeah, color silent. silent. Yes. Yeah. Can you talk more about that? Sure. Um, so let me... Do something with our audience, if I might. So I want to ask you all to think about your earliest race-related memory in the, with the confidence that I'm not going to ask you to tell us about it, um, at least not individually. So raise your hand if you've thought of something, your early, an early race-related memory, your earliest. I, okay, a lot of hands up. So what I would like to... No, a little, it's going to be a little chaotic, but that's okay. Um, I'd like to know how old you were at the time of this memory. So you could just call out some ages. Eight. Okay. I heard three, four, five, six, seven, eight, twelve. I heard, um, I didn't hear anything older than twelve. Anybody older than twelve? No? Okay. Oh, we have one hand up, okay. Um, and anybody younger than three? So there's no right answer to this question. It's all about where you lived, what your social context was, you know, what your memory is likely to be. 
But, and sometimes we heard, you know, there's at least one person who said they were older than 12. Some people are in their teens. Some people, I had one person say in a group once, 35. You know, that the age can really range depending on your life experience. It's hard to get much younger than three and still remember. Um, but I heard a lot of fours, fives, sixes. And that's very common, early elementary, kindergarten, early elementary school. So if you fell in that category, if you were a four, five, six-year-old kind of person, early elementary, could be seven, raise your hand just to, so we can see how many people that describes. Okay. I would say the clearly the majority of you in that, that age range. So what emotion, if any, is attached to that experience? I heard fear. I heard shame. Embarrassment. Curiosity, confusion, sadness, pain, anger. We've covered quite a few uncomfortable emotions, right? Pain, shame, embarrassment, anger, sadness, uh, confusion. Curiosity is probably the most neutral of the ones we heard. and. When I ask these questions, these are often, almost always, the words that come up. So here's my last question for the moment, and that is, raise your hand if you shared this experience at the time it occurred with a concerned adult, a caring adult, a parent or a teacher or someone, you know, older than you. I think I'm seeing maybe 10 hands up in this room of more than 100 people. So raise your hand if you did not. All the rest of you, right? So um, it always comes out this way, right? It always comes out this way that the uh, memory goes back to an early time in one's childhood, that the experience was uncomfortable in a variety of different ways and that there was no conversation about it. How many of you have personal or professional experience with four, five, or six-year-olds? Your own children or somebody else's? A lot of you. And so tell me if I'm right about this. Four, five, and six-year-olds are pretty candid. <laughs> they don't filter much, right? They say what's on their minds. So how is it that so many people had these experiences that were uncomfortable and said nothing? Isn't that counterintuitive? And so the question is, why not? Any hypotheses in this room? You were taught not to say anything. Already at four, five, or six, you already know you're not supposed to talk about it. Right? The adults around you don't want those questions, don't want to hear about it. And so that's what I mean when I say color silent. You know, people have these experiences engaging with race, engaging with difference. Sometimes those experiences are uncomfortable, but we learn at an early age and it gets reinforced as we get older. This is not a topic to talk about, it's a toxic subject. And so a lot of people. Don't talk. One of the points I make in the book is that even this generation of young people, this generation of young people born in the 21st century also don't talk. They, there was a survey done um, by MTV of 14 to 24 year olds in 2014. And they were asked a lot of different questions about race relations, but one of the questions was if they had witnessed incidents of bias defined as a time when someone was being treated unfairly because of their group membership. And almost all of them, 94% said they had seen this happen on more than one occasion. And 76% of them said they believed talking about bias, talking about these incidents, would help reduce prejudice. However, only 20% said they were willing to do so. 74% um, of them said they thought 
they were worried that it might make things worse or it might cause conflict. And so even though people would recognize that bias was a problem, most were uncomfortable or unwilling to have a conversation about it. And at the end of the day, how can we change anything if we can't talk about it? Um, I'm such a firm believer in the power of awkward conversations. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I have time for a couple more questions, and okay. then I just want the audience to know we're going to open it up for audience Q&A. If you have questions for Dr. Tatum, please be ready to come to the front of the stage and use the microphones on either side of the stage, and you can even start um, thinking about lining up in about five minutes, okay? So for the last two questions, so I've spent the last year working on roll call project, which is what um, Dr. Abe mentioned in my bio, and I've been going around and speaking to teachers and students from all over the world and asking them two questions, which okay. I'm going to ask you. Okay. Um, and I think your experience as an educator in an environment like Mount Holyoke must have been a very interesting contrast to then when you were at Spelman. Um, so the two questions are this. The first question is, one, what do you have in common with your students? And the second question is, does it matter that students and teachers have things in common? Okay, so um, certainly I had things in common with my students at Mount Holyoke um, in that Mount Holyoke is in Western Massachusetts, South Hadley, Massachusetts, a small town. And I grew up in Massachusetts in a small town. And so I had that in common with them. And of course, Mount Holyoke is a women's college and as a woman, I had that in common with them. And some of my students were women of color and of course I shared that identity with with those students. Um, fast forward to Spelman, I had the experience of being a black woman at an institution that centers the experiences of black women. And um, I did not grow up in the South, but I am the child of a Southern mother. And so, you know, it was kind of funny when I first came to um, live in Atlanta, many people, because I came there from Massachusetts, would say, oh, this must be new to you. You know, fill in the blank, whatever <laughs> it was. This must be new to you. And I would be like, no, my mother does that. <laughs> you know? um, but at any rate, to get to your question, the second question, so there were lots of things you know, that we had in common. Um, but is it important that teachers and students have things in common? I think it is important for teachers and students to find common ground. That does not necessarily mean they come from the same place. But to share, you know, for the teacher to share the aspiration that that student has for her life and to be invested in it and helping her to achieve it, that's important common ground. To be able to, of course, you know, we all are human beings and experience emotions of joy and sadness and all of that in our common humanity. But I think finding that place of common humanity is essential. Thank you. Thank you. And yeah. your, your work is helping us to do that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we are ready for Q&A. Please don't be shy. Come on up to the microphone. And I should have mentioned it's at the top of the program, but if you are on Twitter, uh, please use the hashtag, hashtag Town Hall Seattle to, to join in the conversation. Hi. Thank Hi. you so much for coming. Um, I haven't had a chance to read your book yet, and so my question is, why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria? <laughs> okay. So I'm going to say, read the book. But, um, <laughs> but I do want to say that when people ask that question, why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria, when I heard it being asked of me, it was often being asked by um, teachers or school administrators, often with the tone of, and what can we do to prevent it? You know, like, this is a problem. Why are they all sitting together? And I think it's important to understand the value in connecting with people with whom you have shared experience, right? There's nothing wrong with sitting with friends who you have a common identity with, particularly in adolescence when you're actively exploring what does it mean to be a member of this group, doing that with your peers, 
that is uh, a perfectly reasonable and uh, important set of activities. For me, the key question is not why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria. The key question is what are we doing in the classroom to engage students across lines of difference so that they are developing their capacity to be able to function effectively in an increasingly diverse society. The more we are doing things in classrooms or in other structured settings where young people can connect across lines of difference, we reduce the likelihood of the kind of separation we see in cafeterias, not because there isn't still value in that, but simply because um, how students define their common ground expands, right? Uh, and, that, and there's value in that. But anywhere you go, I mean, if you are in the position of being the minority, whether that's in the context of US race relations or traveling into a country where people speak a language other than English and you find yourself in a room with other English speakers and lo and behold, you're sitting together in the cafeteria. You know, when you have a sense of shared experience, you wanna gather with those people. That's a natural thing and not to be frightened of it. Um, but we also, it's not an either or in my mind, it's a both and. We want to support the affirmation that comes from that kind of connection, but we also wanna build capacity to engage across lines of difference. Thank you so much for everything you're talking about. You're so smart, I'm gonna follow you everywhere. <laughs> so I'm gonna be one of, the, one of your groupies. <laughs> but anyway, one of the things that's really interesting to me, because you talked about um, the uh, allies, yes. and then you talked about if a teacher isn't, doesn't look just like you or isn't from the same place, you find common ground. One of the things now I get asked a lot of times by my ally friends is how do I know when I am acting out and acknowledging my, um, my benefit from racism? And then what does that look like? And if we are identifying you know, the good action so that we can, when you're in education, go good, that works. How do we set that system up? Because I said, I sort of feel like we have identified what the issues are, but we haven't identified how we say, yep, you got it, and I want you to do more of that. Yes. Because that way it gets us out of the eternal struggle. And I want to know that too, because people look at me and I'm like, I don't exactly know. Yeah. And um, so anyway, that's a question I have. Well, I think. So I'll tell you what I was thinking when you were speaking. And what I was thinking was that this is where it's valuable to have white allies groups, meaning white people working with other white people so that the, the burden of am I doing it right is not always on the people of color, mm -hmm. right? Um, that, you know, that I, I'm not saying that it, there's, there's value in cross-dialogue, cross-racial dialogue, of course. I write a lot about that. But there's also value in um, white people mentoring each other in this regard. So there will be some folks who've been working on what it means to enact white ally behavior for a long time and other people who will be new to it. And the people who are new to it really need to connect with the more experienced white people who are working on it, which is why organizations like Showing Up for Racial Justice or other um, white allies groups can be really valuable. So that, um, you know, all of us are, you know, we're all finding our way, right? If we had figured this all out, we wouldn't be having this conversation now. Um, but it can be quite fatiguing for um, the people of color in the room to always be, you know, help me figure this out. You know, sometimes we have to do our own homework. Yeah. And that maybe segues into um, my question. I um, read your first book and I was really appreciative of the sections on identity development, yes. which I myself was not educated on prior to reading your book. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm feeling now like as white people or as a white person um, coming up 
I had um, I had a, an identity development that included, you know, imbibing the smog of prejudice and racism. Yes. Um, how how do how can we develop an identity, uh, a positive white anti-racist identity? Um, you know, what what is involved in that so mm -hmm. that people have, you know, options when they're coming up you know, uh, and growing up to, to have a, a different kind of identity they can grow into. Yes. Well, I write quite a bit about this, and in, this is one of the topics I talk a lot about in the book. So I'm going to give a brief answer, but also wanting to just acknowledge that there's more information about it in the book. But one of the things that I would say is that it's really important to provide role models. You know, we often talk about the importance of role models for children of color in school. You know, they need to see themselves in the curriculum and all of that, and that is, of course, quite important. But we don't talk about the need for white children to see examples of white anti-racist action, to know what that looks like and to know that there are people who do it, right? Um, when I was teaching, I used to ask my students to name a well-known white person who they would all agree was racist. And it didn't take more than a second or two um, for students to start naming people who they, you know, in the news. And I'm imagining if I would... It might be even easier in the last year <laughs> to come up with a name. I was just going to say, if I were to ask you all to think about just one... Um, <laughs> And, you know, students could do that pretty quickly. But then I would ask, okay, so now I want you to think of a well-known white person still living who um, you would describe as actively anti-racist. Not one. A lot of times students couldn't think of one. And then I would have to mention names, right? And so, um, or introduce them through articles or personal narratives written by people who were doing that work. And so, and I would say still living on purpose because sometimes people would know the names of civil rights workers, for example, white civil rights workers who were killed. Um, but I wanted them to name somebody who was working against racism and lived to tell about it. And that, um, and having those examples, I think is really critical. And you can start with those examples in childhood, right? Um, you don't have to wait till you're in high school or college to be exposed to the work of, um, and they don't have to be famous. They can be right in your neighborhood, you know? I mean, which is, I think, an important piece. I used to invite, because, uh, you know, I could tell students about that, but that's not my lived experience. So I would invite a white anti-racist activist to come to my class and talk about her journey then students would ask questions. And it was very informative for them, but one of the first questions, almost always, she was asked when she came to visit was, did you lose friends? Mm. And I think that's really telling, um, that sense of I will somehow be isolated by others if I speak up about, if I break the silence. And so providing those examples, I think, is really important. Well, thank you. I think that that oh. is our time. Oh. Do we have another one? Oh, we have one, one more. Yes. <laughs> On a personal note, I just want you to know I've been using your book in the classroom since 2002, and students absolutely love your, your work, and they continue to love your work, and I'm so excited there's a 20-year anniversary. But that's not the question. Uh, <laughs> the question relates to a story that happened here last fall. So a year ago, uh, there was a school at a, a majority black school um, that was trying to support their students by affirming uh, Black Lives Matter uh -huh. in the school. And th there was a c partnership. Teachers, educators were going to wear Black Lives Matter shirts. Um, they were going to partner with uh, an organization called Black Men Uniting to Change the Narrative and just sh show the students some love so they felt good about themselves. The press caught wind of this. The right wing caught wind of this. And there was tremendous backlash and, and even a bomb threat. Mm -hmm. And so educators in Seattle organized and, and had a Black Lives Matter at school action in October to try to say, you know, you cannot, we're going to support this school and you cannot threaten us all. And they didn't. And we, and we like, two, two to 3,000 educators wore Black Lives Matter shirts. This year, in February, we planned a Black Lives Matter action week. A national coalition of educators 
are planning a week of action, and I am here to seek your endorsement of that action. It will take. <laughs> Last year we had uh, hundreds of professors sign up um, in support, and so I was going to leave my card. Is there? Will security get me if I leave a card up there? <laughs> Why don't you put it? I'm going to be signing books on this table. Put it okay. right there on but, the table. But we seek your support for more action to keep pushing to keep pushing against all that's happening right now. Thank well, you. Well, thank you for your action. Thank you for your example. <laughs> thank you. Can okay. I? Yeah, okay. I guess. Do we have time? Uh, yes, right. yes. It's cool. Um, hi. Uh, thank you so much for coming out. It's so exciting. And I think your, your book was the first one that I read in college, and it's really helped me contextualize a lot of like identity development, and then really appreciate it. Um, my question has to do with, um, I guess, the co-opting of identity development language, uh, specifically like transgender and transsexual people. Um, and that being co-opted in the same way for transracial and not in the same way of like transracial adoptees, but Rachel Dolezal and Ja Do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah like whatever that is. Um, how do you explain the difference? Um, there's like a gap in my language of like, that is not the same thing. Like you can't, I don't think you can feel a different race to belong. You know, <laughs> I, I, just... I understand the question. I got the question. <laughs> you know, um, I, I understand the question, and I have to say I have been, I'm kind of where you are, which is like, I don't really have the words for that. Um, the, you know, so we, you know, we know and understand and have learned a lot about, I, I don't claim to be an expert, but certainly we have read narratives and heard people talking about the experience of being transgender, right? And so we have a deeper understanding of that. Um, I was doing a talk like this where people were, in, in this case, they were writing questions down. And somebody wrote a question, and the question was, if you can be transgender, how come you can't be transracial? And I had to think a lot about what was the answer to that question. And I'm not sure I have come to a good answer. But what one of the things I thought about was the notion of race is a social construct. It's not biological, right? So if we think about gender, there are body parts, right? You know what I mean? There are male body parts and female body parts, and we can understand um, that the experience of maybe not, you know, that psychological sense of this is, you know, there's something out of alignment, right, that someone might experience, someone who's struggling with being a, with transgender. But when we say somebody is transracial, it's not like you, you're, I mean, gender, because gender is also a social construct, but there are physical differences, right? But human beings have different, hair texture, different eye color, et cetera, but that is not um, signif significant. Thank you, someone's helping me out here. <laughs> you know, that those differences are not biologically meaningful, right? You know, the, they're not biologically meaningful, and if we, you know, the DNA, um, the genome project, right? tells us that there's more variation across groups than there, am I saying that right? No, there's more variation the within groups right. than there is across groups, right? So two black people standing next to each other who are even similar in appearance, you know, in terms of dark skin or light skin or whatever, similar in appearance, might be more different genetically from one another than either is from a white person. That seems counterintuitive, right? Because we put so much value on those differences. But the gen, the, the, D, thank you. The, but the DNA, you know, the, the, the DNA characteristics that determine those differences are very small. So I am, you can see, I haven't quite worked this out um, in my own mind, 
but I think it's hard to equate them. I'm with you. I don't think you can equate them. And I am at, am at a kind of a loss to try to explain it. Um, spoiler alert, I don't talk about it in the book. <laughs> uh, but thank you for your question. I just uh, <clears throat> wanted to maybe get your comment on uh, something that uh, you were talking a little bit earlier about how that white people aren't aware necessarily how that they benefit from racism, right? Well, some are, but often they're not. Yeah, it, I understand. It, yeah. I know that's true. Yeah. But the thing is that the bigger picture is that they might not be aware of how that they are harmed by racism. Uh, that is also true, you yes. Know? And uh, there's the bigger picture is um, the divide and rule picture. You yes. Know? And there is a class war going on, and uh, you, you can just uh, take a look at what happened in the Senate, you know, mm -hmm. if you don't know that. Yes. So I was wondering if you wanted to comment on that a little bit. Well, I certainly do talk in the book about the fact that racism hurts everybody in different ways, right? Um, but we are all paying a price. White people are paying a price for racism. So yes, there are advantages. Some people would use the word, we often use the word privilege, um, benefits that come as a function of that system of advantage. but you know, to, to use a tried and true expression, there's no such thing as a free lunch. It doesn't come for free. There um, definitely are negative impacts. And to your point about um, divide and conquer, you know, historically, we see the consequence, the ways in which um, racial animosity has been used to drive a wedge between uh, poor whites and uh, disenfranchised black people. Certainly that was true in the South during the time of slavery in the Reconstruction era moving forward. Lots of examples historically. And certainly we can see the evidence of that in today's current political context as well. Thank you very much. Um, that is all we have time for. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for your question. Thank you. You can purchase a copy of Dr. Tatum's book at the Third Place Book Table. Um, if you haven't already, this is an incredible, incredible work. And Dr. Tatum will be here at the front signing copies. Thank you.